Hi, everyone. My name is Chris Boudreau, and I'm Manomet's Donor Relations Manager. I want to thank you so much for joining us for tonight's presentation, Warblers 101, Take Your Bird Watching to the Next Level. I'm joined by Evan Dalton, Manomet's Lead Instructor of Land Bird Conservation, uh, who will be leading tonight's webinar. Uh, if you're new to Manomet, we are a science-driven sustainability nonprofit. And since our beginnings in 1969, our programs have branched out far beyond our Plymouth, Massachusetts-based bird banding operation uh, with shorebird recovery and habitat management, forestry and climate science, fisheries and more. Uh, Manomet has its foundation in science and works with many global partners to create a thriving future for us and for birds. So just a couple of quick things before we begin. Uh, at the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen, you should see a box marked Q&A. Uh, if you don't see that, just use your mouse pointer to hover over the bottom of your screen and it should appear. If at any point during tonight's presentation you have a question, uh, feel free to click on that Q&A box and enter your question so that Evan can answer it at the end. Uh, and if you're unable to stay for the entirety of tonight's presentation, we are recording it and we'll share with you in a follow-up email a link where you can watch it. So again, I just want to thank you so much for joining us and now I'd like to turn it over to Evan Dalton. Thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, this is uh, pretty exciting. Um, it's certainly an exciting time outside and uh, we're very happy to have you guys here. Um, I'm gonna try uh, stopping sharing here. I don't know if you guys are seeing this weird yellow window here, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to get rid of that. I don't know what that's all about. Um, but anyways, uh, this is certainly the time of year to be getting out there. Uh, checking out all the warblers, checking out all the other new arrivals. Um, and uh, I hope you guys are, are excited as, as excited as I am for spring to finally be here. Um, particularly now that um, things have certainly changed in a very odd and peculiar way. Uh, hopefully you guys are getting more time even um, to actually get outside and, and, and look for some stuff. And, uh, you know, one of the most wonderful things about migration is that it, it happens every year no matter what. Um, and I think that uh, hopefully this year uh, it, it'll be pretty exciting for us all to get out there and, and maybe uh, see some things that we haven't seen before. Um, all right, so we're all here and we're here to see warblers. Um, why warblers? Um, well, they're pretty awesome in many ways. Uh, for one, I love warblers because they uh, represent a whole bunch of uh, diversity, so biodiversity. Um, they live in all different types of habitats, um, and they arrive in the spring, uh, or many of them arrive in the spring, um, and really mark the arrival of the spring migration, which truly is a, a lovely spectacle um, all throughout the U.S. Um, I should say that tonight, um, uh, Regardless of where you're tuning in from, I'm, I'm trying to make this presentation um, fairly uh, broad, uh, but uh, there are some differences between Eastern and Western warblers. Um, and this uh, is primarily gonna be focused on warblers that you encounter um, in the Northeast um, of, the, of, of, of uh, the United States. Um, but yeah, they definitely mark the arrival of uh, a whole bunch of different migrants, not just warblers, um, but when you are seeing warblers in the trees, you're also seeing things like vireos that have, haven't spent the winter with us. Um, you're seeing orioles that haven't spent the winter with us. So uh, a lot of very exciting things are, are coming back and warblers are really sort of the, uh, the, the icing on top, if you will. Um, many warblers are absolutely beautiful. Uh, this is a stunning uh, male bay-breasted warbler. Um, and he is uh, pretty neat. Um, you're gonna love uh, just all the different types of colors that these have. A lot of warblers have very bright yellow, um, reds, blues, lots of greens. Um, so really uh, lots of different colors that you can see within them. Um, and they're very small and represent quite a challenge. Um, a lot of people go a long time without seeing a warbler. Um, and that's primarily because most of these aren't going to be visiting your feeder. Um, they, they, a lot of them tend to stay pretty high up in trees when they're moving through. Um, so unless you're really deliberately going out and looking for migrating birds, 
uh, it's very easy to miss warblers or miss a lot of the warblers as they're moving through. Um, at Manomet, we really appreciate warblers as well because um, their numbers are numbers that we actually keep uh, tabs on through our uh, banding and censusing operations. Um, and then through those uh, scientific operations, we're actually um, able to keep tabs and use them sort of as a, a bellwether for uh, the health of migrant bird populations um, throughout North America. Um, let's see if I can get this thing to go. Here we go. All right, so a little bit of uh, history. I hope this isn't too boring, but um, uh, Warblers are pretty neat in that our warblers, or what we call wood warblers here in this in uh, in uh, the New World, are are particularly limited, or specifically limited to North and South America, or North Central and South America, so the Western Hemisphere. Um, all the warblers that are over in uh, Europe, Africa, Asia, um, those are actually from a uh, completely unrelated uh, group of birds. Uh, so the, the North American wood warblers are unique amongst themselves. Uh, there are about 115 species throughout the uh, Western Hemisphere, and um, just over 50, about 57 of them, I think, uh, spend uh, their time in North America. Um, now, a lot of them uh, do not spend uh, the entire year in North America, um, and they're really primarily capitalizing on um, a, a really huge boom in food uh, around late spring and throughout the summer. Um, and that boom in food, particularly insects, is what they actually capitalize on to raise their young. Um, it's thought that all North American wood warblers that we get uh, actually originated from Central or maybe South American ancestors. Um, and if you go to uh, Central America, for instance, since this, uh, this, this species over here on the right is actually um, uh, a species called the yellow-rumped warbler. Uh, we'll talk about the eastern subspecies of this later called the myrtle warbler. That's the one on top with a white throat. If you go west, you'll actually encounter a different subspecies of this bird called an Audubon's warbler. They're both yellow-rumped warblers. Um, but these are actually a really good indication that uh, as these birds sort of uh, took advantage of melting ice caps um, that were uh, expanding across North America, um, that uh, they actually were split by some of the uh, geographic variation or the, the actual geographic span of, of these ice caps. So this uh, map here is a bit tough. We're looking down at the North Pole, um, but if we look at North America, this is the southernmost extent of the last glaciation. Um, this is the Laurentide ice sheet, this blue thing. Um, and you can actually see that it extends very far into the, very, very much through the Midwest. Um, so there really are sort of, a, a, there really were, I should say, not now, fortunately, um, but there really were uh, sort of two distinct uh, sections of land that these things could capitalize on. Um, and so what we think happened is that as uh, Eastern Myrtle Warbler ancestor, uh, went into the eastern part of the U.S. and the myrtle warbler ancestor went into the western part. Um, over a very short period of time, they actually uh, developed uh, these slight differences. So um, uh, the the um, uh, the presence of a black mask, for instance, or uh, the uh, yellow coloration on the throat, which is the most noticeable difference between an Audubon's and a myrtle warbler. Uh, probably evolved over uh, maybe only a, a few hundred thousand years, which doesn't really seem like a, um, uh, a short period of time, but evolutionarily speaking, that's, that's very quick. Um, so because a lot of these uh, birds actually speciated uh, not so long ago, hybrids do occur. We won't talk much about hybrids because that just makes things super confusing, um, but they do occur in, in these guys, which is interesting too. Um, so yeah, and the fact that they were capitalizing on a sort of novel habitat um, means that a lot of different species actually um, are sharing a very small, relatively small uh, chunk of land. And so when you have that happening, what you have are sort of a adaptive radiation or a lot of different uh, diverse forms coming out of, of uh, sort of a common ancestor. So just for example, uh, these are four species of wood warbler. Um, and they, they all have pretty different bills. Um, and that's because they specialize on different things. So over here on the left, we have a black and white warbler. 
Um, and this bird uh, creeps along tree trunks much like a nuthatch does. Um, and it uses its really long curved bill to probe into crevices and bark. Um, interestingly, they also have gigantic feet and, and uh, claws that allow them to crawl around on trees. Um, if you look at some of the birds with more, uh, some of the warblers with more pointed bills, things like this Nashville warbler in the middle on top and a worm eating warbler down below, both of these are using their pointy bills to uh, probe into uh, crevices as well, um, but they're much shorter. And that's because uh, things like a, a Nashville warbler are actually capitalizing on uh, flowering trees. And so they're using their small bill to pick apart flowers. Um, uh, worm eating warblers here uh, were actually, uh, they actually specialize on hanging dead oak leaves. Um, among other things. Um, and they have a very stout bill that allows them to pick apart those leaves. Um, over here on the right is a really extreme example. Uh, this is an American red star, and you can see, uh, maybe be able to see on this uh, bird here, that its bill is actually um, sort of flattened and more triangular shaped than some of these others. Um, and it's flattened sort of like um, uh, two hands sort of clapping together, and that's to uh, increase surface area, and that's because these guys really specialize on fly catching. Uh, their bill actually resembles a lot of the fly catchers in, in North America. Um, they also have these really cool little bristles, like a mustache on either side of their bill, um, and it's thought that uh, those bristles actually help them uh, funnel more uh, insects into their, into their mouth. Um, so lots of different forms, and these are just four species of the you know, 50, 50 odd species in North America. So you can imagine there are lots of different um, uh, forms on these birds, but also there are some birds that, that share similar forms, but actually uh, have diversified in the uh, different areas of the tree that they forage on. Um, and this, uh, these adaptations here were actually first noted by uh, Robert MacArthur, and a sort of very famous, I guess, amongst ornithologists. I, I'm not going to say famous because it's amongst ornithologists, so very little that we do is famous. Um, but in 1958, uh, MacArthur wrote a very uh, uh, seminal uh, paper on niche partitioning. So basically, uh, he observed all of these birds uh, breeding warblers up in the boreal forest and actually took copious notes on uh, exactly where these birds were foraging in trees. Um, and you can see that um, certain things like a myrtle warbler here, which we were just talking about, um, they tend to spend most of their time sort of up near the top, um, but sometimes down near the bottom as well. Uh, one bird that was always at top was the Blackburnian warbler. Um, so there are a whole bunch of different ways that these things can, can um, coexist without necessarily competing. Um, if competition occurs, then one species eventually gets wiped out. Um, but if there's plenty of food, which in the boreal forest during the summer, there definitely is, um, they actually have other ways of, of separating their efforts. Um, so not only are they a really interesting window into the world of biodiversity and evolution, um, but also more recently we've realized that warblers are a really great example, or a really great, um, as I said earlier, sort of an indicator of uh, overall migrant uh, health. Um, so at Manomet, we've been uh, over 50 years now, we've been uh, catching, marking, and, and releasing uh, migrant bird species uh, at our banding lab. Um, we, this year is our first year that we're, um, our first spring where we're not doing a full effort, unfortunately, um, but we are supplementing with uh, regular surveys, uh, auditory and visual surveys as well. So we're still collecting data on uh, migrant abundance, um, but we can see here that this is a graph over 50 years. Um, and this is basically a, a general proxy for the amount of birds that we've banded, uh, corrected for the effort that we put into it. So this is just a general index of sort of um, abundance of birds that we that we're catching new birds that we're catching and banding um, and it might not seem like a very dramatic drop-off here um, but if we do look where on average if we follow this uh, black trend line here um, we're probably hovering around 15 or so uh, birds per 100 net hours here um, whereas down more recently we've actually cut that number in half um, now this isn't specifically looking at uh, one or two species. This is looking at our, our captures overall, 
Um, but a major driver of these declines are actually uh, the neotropical migrants. So when I say neotropical migrant, um, I'm talking about a species of bird that typically breeds in the uh, northern hemisphere. Uh, usually for, for these warblers, a lot of them are breeding in the boreal forest that spans across um, all of Canada. Um, and, uh, and then uh, they actually migrate down into the tropics. So neotropical, the new world tropics. Um, so when I'm talking about neotropical migrants, I'm talking about birds like uh, this magnolia warbler here, um, a stunning bird. Um, and uh, when we talk about drop-offs in the numbers of magnolia warblers that we see, um, they definitely represent a significant conservation challenge. Um, just thinking about uh, what might be driving population declines in a species like magnolia warbler, it's an incredibly complex question. Um, so as I said, magnolia warblers are, are like a lot of these warblers, they'll breed across the boreal forests. Um, and uh, they prefer spruce trees for nesting. Um, and uh, then they actually will migrate in the spring and the fall through this yellow swath here. This map is courtesy of um, Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, you can find on their website, All About Birds. And you can find really detailed, great information on um, pretty much every North American bird species. So that's a great resource if you guys are writing down resources. Um, so they migrate through this entire swath of uh, yellow on their way south and they'll spend their winter in the Yucatan. Um, Manomet scientists encountered uh, magnolia warblers on the wintering grounds uh, when we were doing field work in Belize down in the Yucatan Peninsula. Um, and some of them will actually overwinter in the Caribbean as well. Um, but if you look at the overall area of uh, non-breeding uh, range and breeding range, uh, the non-breeding range is actually far smaller in area than the breeding range. Um, and a lot of focus traditionally was placed on preserving uh, the nesting habitat of these birds. Um, but uh, if you think about it, one acre removed of boreal forest is probably equivalent to only maybe a half an acre of uh, rainforest removed down in the Yucatan. To compound that, um, birds like this magnolia warbler are spending probably, mm, I would say, uh, late November through March down there. And then they'll uh, start moving northwards. So they're really spending almost half the year uh, on their overwintering grounds. And we often like to think of uh, warblers as being our birds, uh, but they're really not. They're kind of on vacation. They're on holiday. Um, and so, uh, if they spend all their time in a much smaller area, you can imagine that the conservation of um, tropical forest where these birds are actually, a lot of them are maintaining territories and have their own uh, home turf down there is incredibly important for, uh, for um, uh, the conservation of these birds. So we'll keep this in mind. All right, so we're gonna get into uh, some tips that you guys can use for finding warblers. Now, like I said earlier, this is actually a spectacular time of year. Um, Mid-May uh, is uh, really the, the peak of warbler migration in the Northeast. Um, and uh, that's really when uh, you get, uh, you can get sort of overlap of, of several waves of warblers. And I'll be talking about waves of warblers in a minute. Um, but uh, it really is sort of the peak for diversity in mid-May in the Northeast. Um, this year is in shaping up to be a particularly interesting year um, where very cold uh, weather patterns and north, northern winds and cold rain uh, have actually uh, really uh, held back the leaf out of a lot of the trees here. Um, our oak trees don't look anything like uh, this photo here. Um, and this photo here, I think, was taken in early May one year. Um, so uh, our trees haven't leafed out quite a bit, um, and the birds are actually being held back by winds. Um, all of these warblers migrate at night. Um, they're using stars to navigate, and migrating at night actually helps them avoid predators, and it also allows them to uh, eat all day uh, to fuel up for another flight um, a few nights later. Um, so uh, they're heavily reliant upon tailwinds to get them through everything. 
Um, and uh, it's a uh, Tonight is actually shaping up to be an interesting night for migration, particularly in the Northeast. Um, so all these birds have been bottled up. Many of them are sort of in the mid-Atlantic now. Um, and tonight we're gonna have some really strong southerly winds. Um, and then around midnight tonight, uh, there's the possibility of some strong uh, storms coming through. And when that happens, it actually drives birds down to the nearest uh, shelter they can find um, and oftentimes that can mean very heavy concentrations of birds in some areas. Um, birders sometimes call that fallout. Um, it's, it makes it sound uh, really intense and cool. Um, but let me tell you, if you're actually in the middle of that, whew, it's pretty amazing. Um, so this is a good time to be uh, getting out there and uh, I would suggest uh, getting out there tomorrow uh, if you can, particularly in the morning and uh, just checking some patches of woods. Um, but in general, uh, tips for, for finding warblers. Um, in my experience, it's really important to, to be comfortable with using your binoculars. And you may say, you're, you might be like John James Audubon and really prefer to use your, your, uh, your ones, as we call them, just your normal eyes. And that will work for birds that are out in the open, um, but, uh, but uh, these birds are often very high up in the trees. Uh, this view here of a Blackburnian warbler in this picture is sort of typically what you might see if the bird is being very cooperative. Um, oftentimes you only see half of the bird or something, um, but we won't get into that at the moment. Um, so binoculars really are a must. We have to remember that uh, Audubon also had a shotgun and was blasting these out of a tree so he could look at them closer. So um, that's all good. Uh, not shooting them out of trees, but having binoculars, that's good. Um, and I would definitely practice uh, finding birds in trees. Um, it's, like I said, it's very easy to find birds when they're out in the open, uh, particularly with binoculars. Um, but my one tip for finding birds in trees that helps the most is uh, if you uh, are looking or if you hear something strange up in a tree, uh, look for movement. As soon as you see movement, uh, keep your eyes locked on that target and raise your binoculars up to your eyes and align them with your eyes. Um, don't move your eyes at all. And uh, I would say, generally speaking, uh, if you get your binoculars up and don't see anything, uh, don't try to move your head with your binoculars while you're looking through it, because uh, that doesn't usually work either. I'd just remove your binoculars and look for the movement again and then lift them up. Um, those are my tips for, for finding tiny things moving around in trees. Um, if you're looking for a lot of different types of warbler, we just learned that they love different types of habitat. Uh, even on migration, some of them can be very specific. So pine warblers almost always seek out a pine tree, even if it's a small patch of forest. They prefer to sing from pine trees even on migration. Um, so finding a place that has a bunch of different habitats is super key for finding a bunch of different types of things. Um, and as I just said, follow the weather. So um, if it's going to be really rainy and cold and, and the past few days have had north winds and everything, uh, chances are you're not going to see too many migrants the next morning. Um, that being said, you never know what you're going to find unless you get out there. Um, so yeah, the next, uh, yeah, so, okay. So, say that you do get out there and you find a warbler, okay? We're going to talk about what makes a warbler a warbler in a second. And this over here, if we can commit it to memory, is a beautiful example of a myrtle warbler. So this is the eastern subspecies of yellow-rumped warbler. Um, we'll just call them yellow-rumped warblers uh, for the sake of this. Some people like calling them butter butts uh, because it looks like they have butter on their butt. I don't know. I guess that's why. Um, of course that's why. We know this. Um, anywho, uh, so this is sort of our prototypical warbler here. It's got a, uh, we can tell it because it has a particularly long wings for its body. It's a small bird uh, and it has a lovely bill that uh, is uh, particularly uh, nondescript. Um, we'll compare this bill to some of the other groups of birds uh, that we might see that look kind of like warblers. So warblers uh, don't have a ton of variation in their size, unlike some other groups of birds. So warblers tend to be around sparrow sized. Um, so if you're used to seeing a house sparrow, uh, most warblers are slightly smaller than a house sparrow. 
they're slightly smaller than a house finch. Um, they're definitely uh, significantly smaller than a robin and a blackbird. Um, and they're a little bit bigger um, than, uh, than other things. So they're definitely bigger than hummingbirds. Um, and they're, yeah, so they're, they're sort of a, a, a particularly small bird. And so they pack a lot of color onto them, which is pretty neat. Um, so to see a warbler, some things to keep track of are what it's doing, where it is, um, once again, bill shape is important, and we're going to try to remember what different coloration they have. Um, warblers are a really great example of a group that has a whole bunch of different field marks. So when we say field marks, we're talking about identifiable characteristics. Um, so I just talked about a uh, butter butt, and that's something that's pretty helpful on this guy. Only a few other warbler species have yellow on their rump. Um, this bird also has white bars going across a, a sort of a, a horizontal bars on its wings. Those are called wing bars. Um, uh, these right here. Um, it's also got a nice face mask. It has white above and below its eyes and something we call eye arcs. Um, it's got all kinds of fun stuff. So when we're talking about field marks, we're talking about all kinds of stuff. So we've got the wing bars. Um, a lot of them have flank streaking or breast streaking. Um, some of them have different colored under tail coverts. Uh, a lot of warblers have white in their tail in different patterns. Um, a lot of them have eye lines or eyebrows. This is all stuff that you do not have to remember. Um, in fact, most field guides actually have illustrations like this that are better than this. Uh, right in the front cover of the field guide. Um, so these are terms you don't necessarily have to remember, um, but they are just indicators. I want to put them on here just to show you that that um, any part of these birds can actually have a, um, a useful field mark on them. Um, and we will actually, a lot of times you can actually capitalize on that uh, when you're in the field because very rarely do you see uh, this bird on the right as a Cape May warbler very rarely do you see them standing out like this at eye level. They're usually 100 feet up in a spruce tree or something, and you're just looking at its belly. Um, but if we know that they have very fine streaking on their belly, then we, then we might be able to uh, identify this thing. Um, so these are things to look for. Uh, when we look at the species accounts, um, those are things that... Uh, that um, I'll try to point out on individual birds um, if they're distinctive. Um, lastly, here's a particularly confusing slide. I was going to use this one here, but uh, we won't go there. Um, but I just want to point out some, some other creatures that are often migrating in the same time that warblers are, um, but uh, that are uh, slightly different. Um, so down in the lower left, we have a female bay-breasted warbler. And like I said, one of the things to look for is really the, the body shape and then that bill. Um, so the bill on a bay-breasted warbler is, is uh, kind of like a, a pair of chopsticks or, or, or something like that. Um, if we look at the scarlet tanager here, it's an insect eater, but they eat giant insects. So they eat giant caterpillars and things. So their bill is really heavy and strong. Also, uh, the birds on this page are more or less to scale. Um, so a scarlet tanager is much larger than a bay-breasted warbler. Uh, orchard orioles are still pretty small. It's, I guess they're a little bit bigger than, than uh, this here. But an orchard oriole is about the size of a scarlet tanager. And all orioles have uh, very long triangular bills that come to an extremely fine point. Um, they've also got very long tails and big honking blue feet. Um, blue feet are also something that vireos have. Um, and vireo feet and orchard feet are far more powerful typically than, than the, the small perching feet that uh, warblers have. So that can be a helpful clue sometimes. Uh, vireos are probably the most often confused with warblers. Uh, there are only four or five species of vireo that you might encounter throughout the year in the Northeast. Um, so it's good to familiarize yourself with those um, just in case you encounter one. Um, but uh, vireos have thick bills that have a nice strong hook at the tip. Um, and vireos have sort of a, a, a different uh, demeanor than, than warblers. 
Uh, they stick to the tops of trees and they often sit still for long periods of time um, while they're singing. Um, so uh, they can be very frustrating when they're singing up there because you, it can be pretty hard to see them if they're not moving. If you remember the strategy for, for finding these things, um, it, can be, it can be pretty tough. Um, lastly, we've got flycatchers and they've got, uh, you can't particularly see on this, but its bill is pretty flat. Um, so it's got a broad flat bill. Uh, flycatchers sit upright, um, so they, they have very great posture. They have really big eyes, usually with big eye rings. Um, and uh, like I said, they, al they also are not usually um, uh, moving about a ton. And when they move, they fly out uh, from a perch, grab an insect in midair, and typically fly back to a similar perch. Um, these are things to be aware of. Um, I don't expect you to be able to tell the difference between all these things uh, immediately, um, but they are things that, that might look similar. Now also, I picked an extremely nondescript uh, warbler here as well, just for comparison. So I'm just trying to be tricky and, and mess you up. Um, all right, so lastly, I wanna talk about timing. Um, and uh, timing is of, of warblers and most migrants is related to a few things. It's related to weather patterns. Um, so I was saying earlier that the north winds have kept a lot of these southerly birds repressed. Um, and they haven't been able to move up as quick. Um, but it's also related to, um, to the abundance of food. Um, so if these birds are arriving further south of, of uh, the Northeast and uh, food is not abundant enough, uh, they're not gonna be able to uh, store up enough uh, energy and fat reserves um, to make the flight further north anyways. So they might be repressed by um, lack of leaf out and food. Um, and uh, then the last thing that influences uh, how uh, quickly birds uh, arrive and what time they arrive is actually how long they have to go. It's maybe the most obvious one. Um, so if a bird spends its entire winter in South America, uh, it's got a much further distance to go to the boreal forest than say a palm warbler that spent its winter in Florida. Um, so uh, these are all things that, uh, that conspire to uh, sort of uh, mean that warbler, different species of warblers arrive in sort of waves. Um, now these waves are, are by no means uh, concrete uh, and individuals of any species, uh, they're birds, they have wings, they can show up whenever and wherever they want uh, and oftentimes they show up in weird places. Uh, but as far as the waves go, I'm talking about kind of the um, the uh, sort of the peak arrival of each of these species. Um, and I should say as well that uh, even within a species, uh, differing ages and sexes will actually migrate through in different times. So for instance, the uh, magnolia warbler, when it moves through Manomet, the first magnolia warblers we see are adult males. Um, these are birds that have migrated north and south multiple times. Um, and they're on a mad dash to get up to the boreal forest to uh, stake their claim on their favorite patch of spruce. Um, the next birds to move through are typically the females and young males. Um, so those birds, uh, females don't have too much pressure to, to set up a territory. Um, so they're just waiting for the males to duke it out for a bit and they arrive on the scene uh, and uh, choose males accordingly. Um, young males haven't done the journey before, so they get back, and by the time they get back, the best territories are taken, so they typically don't have the best territory. Um, and that pattern holds true for a lot of, um, a lot of our warbler species as they move through. Um, okay, so I'm going to go through, uh, I, I would say about, I think it's 10 species, um, and I'm going to share a lot of information about these 10 species. Um, and I don't expect all of it to stick. In fact, I don't expect most of it to stick, and that's totally fine because, quite frankly, you can find most of this information in any book. Um, but the information I'm presenting to you, I'm presenting uh, with the hope that um, something within it uh, works for you. So we'll play sounds of some of these species, maybe the sound works for you. Um, we'll look at uh, images of, of uh, you know, what, what their body looks like. We'll look at 
uh, some of the, the, the characteristics that they may have or some of the behavior they may have. And maybe something on there will click with you. Uh, but either way, um, we're just going to be sort of throwing a lot of information at you. Um, and that's okay. Uh, lastly, I hope that the information I present to you will give you an idea of, um, even if it doesn't stick in your mind, um, it will at least give you an idea of some of the things that birders are looking at uh, when they see birds, um, and that will give you an idea of what you should be looking at uh, when you see a bird that you might not recognize. Okay, so, and we'll go through, uh, so that I've got uh, an underline underneath the birds' names when I go through them. Uh, and uh, early migrants are ones that probably start in uh, mid to late April and sort of peak around uh, late April or early May. Uh, Mid-season migrants are ones that really peak in the middle of May and late season migrants are peaking sort of right around the end of May. So like I said, if you think of these as all sort of bell curves, uh, we've been seeing a lot of bell curves recently in the news, uh, but if we think of those bell curves um, as something happier like warblers, um, then uh, we think of the spot, that sweet spot, where all of the, uh, the bell curves are sort of overlapping. And that really is sort of the middle of May typically around here. So um, it's a pretty good time to be getting out. Um, okay, so we'll deal with some early birds here. Um, so right here, we've got one that we've already talked about. Um, this is the yellow-rumped warbler. And this is the eastern subspecies or the myrtle warbler. Um, but uh, yellow rump warblers do have a yellow rump. They've got uh, yellow epaulets or yellow shoulder patches. Um, like I said, lots of these warblers have tail spots, so these guys have that. Um, their uh, Latin name or scientific name here is Cetophaga coronata. Um, it actually refers to um, the uh, crown on the top of their head. So they actually have a little yellow spot on the top of their head that's sometimes visible when they're upset. Um, Yellow rump warblers are one of the, the few species of warbler that might actually overwinter in the Northeast. Um, they have a really interesting habit of, uh, or a really interesting characteristic where they can actually digest the waxy coating around myrtle berries um, or bay berries in the Northeast. Um, and uh, that actually allows them to stick along the coast for a longer period of time than a lot of these other uh, warblers go. So like I said, if you've got a shorter distance to go, um, chances are you'll be moving through quicker. Um, some of these guys will nest in Massachusetts if there are dense spruce stands, um, but generally speaking, they'll be heading a little bit further north and west. Um, I've got sort of these uh, kind of descriptors of what their songs sound like. Um, these guys have a, a sweet sound to their, to their song, and I'm going to try to play this. Let me see, make sure that I'm... Um, da, 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 da. Okay. I'm now sharing my sound. So, okay, so we're going to play what a yellow rump warbler sound like. It's, it, this song, their song in particular is, is particularly variable. Um, a lot of other warbler songs follow a formula or something um, or a mnemonic, but these guys just have a very variable sort of weak trill um, that you'll often hear when they're foraging amongst the trees. So we'll, we'll listen, listen to it a couple times. Nope, that didn't work. We'll try it again. Here we go. So hopefully you guys can hear that. So it's usually slurred and it usually sort of changes uh, a little bit sort of halfway through the middle. Um, once again, uh, there are a lot of really great resources out there too uh, for listening to these things. I'll talk about those right at the end um, that you can actually get recordings of these that you can listen to on your own time and, and kind of listen to uh, try to try to uh, just get an idea of what these things sound like. Um, but most warblers, they're either going to have sort of a sweet tone to their song and a lot of them have buzzy tones to their songs. Um, generally speaking though, if you're used to having your window cracked open and just listening to robins and stuff singing outside, um, when warblers are moving through or, or a, a new species is moving through, if you've gotten used to the, the things that are normally in your yard, um, hopefully some of them will stick out. Um, all right, so this next slide, once again, is uh, a lot of information. I don't expect you to, to remember all of it. Um, but they, uh, so I've, I've got over here on the left, these are our views of this bird 
um, that even if it were in a tree and you only saw, say, this portion of the bird, you'd be able to identify it. Um, so say this one down here on the lower left, it's got that really deep black vest with the orange shoulder patch, diagnostic right there. Um, same thing with these sort of steely blue back feathers with a bright yellow rump, diagnostic. Um, and then over here on the right, we've got kind of generally speaking, uh, where you'll often encounter these birds is in the green patch here on a tree. Um, so sort of mid height. Um, and then down here, uh, each of these warblers actually has a unique head pattern too. Um, so even if you get a look at its face, um, you can identify every species of warbler in North America, um, if you get a good enough look at the face. Um, so a lot of people, uh, they recognize other people. Uh, a lot of birders recognize birds immediately from one thing or another. Um, if you get to know a bird really well, uh, you're not pondering through whether it has uh, tail spots or if it has uh, two wing bars. Uh, you just sort of instantly recognize it. Um, and that can be particularly exciting for birds if they're just moving through because it's like seeing an old friend for, for a minute before you have to go another year. It's actually kind of sad. Never mind. It's mostly sad. Uh, anywho, uh, also down here we've got sort of their predominant colors. So I kind of uh, rounded up here in some cases, like with yellow, um, but just sort of uh, splitting the bird, if you split it into sort of four sections, uh, what are the sort of predominant colors on that bird? Um, so these really do have a lot of that steely blue, lots of white, and then flashes of yellow, and then black on the mask and the vest. Um, so this is the yellow rumped warbler. Okay, we'll move on here. Our next early season bird is the pine warbler. Uh, pine warblers are, are totally linked to white pines. Um, so white pine trees are where these guys nest, they're where they overwinter, uh, and uh, if you actually keep a suet feeder in the northeast near some piney woods, uh, there's a good chance you actually have these guys come down. They're one of the few species of warbler that might visit a suet feeder, uh, particularly if the times get tough in the winter. Um, but like I said, once again, if they overwinter in sort of North America, uh, they'll be the first ones to move through. And pine warblers, if they find a good stand of uh, white pine trees, they'll actually nest nearby. So these do nest in New England um, and in pretty big numbers, um, particularly in areas like uh, southeastern Mass, where you have the pine barrens, um, lots of pine warblers, a really great one to know. Um, this is a, a super bright um, adult male pine warbler, um, but they can vary anywhere. So if you imagine that yellow on this bird, it could be anywhere from this bright yellow to just sort of a dull sand color. And actually, if you guys are following along on Facebook, and um, we actually posted a mystery warbler that we caught in the spring of last year on there, um, and it only had a few patches of sort of an orangey yellow color on it, that was actually a pine warbler. Um, so pine warblers, uh, Regardless of their color, they actually have these uh, weak, broken eyeglasses here, so a weak spectacle. They've got bright white wing bars here. They have a ton of white in their tail, a jet black bill, um, and a little bit of streaking on the sides, not much. Um, they have a really uh, lovely song, I think. I associate it with uh, warm summers uh, in piney woods. Um, it's a very lazy trill. It's similar to a uh, chipping sparrow, if you see those in your front lawn. But chipping sparrows are very mechanical. Uh, pine warblers, they're not nearly as mechanical. It, it often um, uh, swells in volume in some places, uh, usually near the end. Um, and uh, the trills aren't as mechanical, they're more slurred. So this is what a pine warbler sounds like here. Play it one more time. Nice trill. Um, go on to our second slide here, and this actually shows you um, the extremes of pine warblers. So this one on the right here, uh, and, and generally speaking, the bright ones, uh, the really brightly colored ones, are um, older, uh, older birds, and a lot of times they're older male birds. Um, and then these gray ones or slightly yellow ones tend to be young males and mostly females. Um, so there is some indication within the species that uh, of um, uh, 
uh, I guess, sex and fitness, um, which is useful for them. Uh, but we have here this uh, nice broken eye ring that's a little bit brighter than anything. And you can even see on this pale bird that it's got a broken white eye ring um, and then a really dark bill and these bold wing bars as well. Um, pine warblers tend to stay pretty high up in trees. They don't often come down to uh, check things out closer to the ground. All right. Our next early warbler is an aptly named black and white warbler. Uh, they're actually black and white. Uh, black and white warblers are sometimes known as sort of the, the nuthatch of warblers. Uh, like I said earlier, they uh, probe with their long down curved bill into crevices and tree bark, uh, looking for insects and insect eggs. Um, and as they do that, they actually creep around on tree trunks kind of like a nuthatch. So they can climb upside down um, and they're very active about it. Um, they're pretty fun to watch. Um, the male black and white warbler has a dark throat and it really is just a study in black and white. Um, striped all over in black and white. Um, and it's got a nice black mask as well. And then head stripes too in black and white. Um, females uh, look similar, but uh, they've got a little bit more buffy tones on them and they don't have that black throat. Um, these guys have a, a really fun song to hear. Um, and some of these will actually nest nearby. Um, and since they're uh, early season uh, migrants, you can actually encounter them all throughout the, uh, the season, uh, the, the migration season. So um, you can encounter black and white warblers quite a bit. They're certainly a good one to learn. Um, their song sounds like a squeaky wheel, sort of a wisa wisa noise. We'll listen to this. Play that one again. And uh, it's a very high and thin vocalization. Um, but this is one where, where if you get really familiar with it, like I was driving around earlier today and drove past a red maple swamp, um, which is a great place for these guys to be migrating through um, and heard a couple of these things just as I was driving my car. So a really distinctive song um, and it, it's really piercing and, and cuts a long distance uh, and can even get into your car. So that's fun. Um, so this is what they look like, some good diagnostic looks. Um, one of the cool things about them is that even their, uh, the, the feathers underneath their tail are black and white. Um, and they're one of the few warblers and really one of the few North American birds that has that nice black and white coloration under the tail. So very dapper. Um, this is a female here striking a pose. Um, you can see she lacks that black throat and has um, so this uh, nice uh, bay color, sort of uh, buffy coloration around the, the flanks and around her throat. Um, predominantly black and white. Uh, and I've got on here highlighted that these guys really don't specialize on leaves at all. They really are on branches and trunks of trees um, because of their habit for picking through bark. Okay, I think this is our last uh, early warbler, uh, but these guys have just arrived back uh, in force. Uh, this is the common yellow throat, not to be confused with the yellow throated warbler, um, but the common yellow throat is also a warbler with a yellow throat. Um, the common yellow throat is found in, in uh, so many uh, different habitats, but mostly around water, uh, or almost always around water. Um, they like roadsides, they love thickets, um, they'll be in salt marshes, um, and their song is, is probably very familiar if you live near any, any one of those things. It's sort of a loud uh, witchity, 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 witch. Um, I'll play it right here. And they'll go throughout most of the day too. And even though these guys like to skulk around, they don't spend much time out in the open like this guy here. Um, in the breeding season, uh, males will actually not only stand out in the open like this, but they'll also engage in a display flight where they'll sing like this and then uh, burst into flight very high up and then dive down into the nearest thicket. Uh, while giving a, a longer song um, that uh, sounds kind of like R2-D2. So this is their display flight song here. It's 
pretty fun. Um, so yeah, these guys are thicket birds, and unlike a lot of other migratory warblers, these guys have pretty short wings. Um, and we like to point out their short wings because that's probably an adaptation for them hanging out in a really dense vegetation. If you have long wings, it makes it really hard to squeeze through small areas or small, small uh, openings. Um, so they do a lot of skulking. Um, they're pretty fun though. Uh, they got that black robber's mask um, and then kind of these frosted tips um, above, their, uh, above their head there. Um, so super fun. Females look very similar. Um, but, uh, but they're, they're pretty good too. They got that yellow throat and then sort of a clay color on the back. Um, so I'm running a little low on time here, but I'm going to sort of cruise through some of these and just play the songs and you guys can sort of read the notes here. Uh, next warbler here is a yellow warbler. It's got a very sweet song. It sounds like they're saying sweet, sweet, sweet. I'm so sweet. Oops. Just here we go. Play this song. Very sweet. And then uh, let's see, since we're just getting into the middle of it, we'll go with this guy here, the northern perula. Buzzy and explosive. Super fun. These guys are pretty stunning as well. And they've, they're the first species we've seen that has a very pointy bill. Northern Perula is really like flowering trees. Um, and they use that pointy bill to pick apart flowers. Another buzzy species here is the black throated green warbler. A very uh, familiar song for those who've spent any time up in Maine. Uh, in those spruce forests in the summertime. Um, pretty good. And aptly named black-throated and green. Very good. Uh, here's a mid-season warbler that you might see tomorrow if you get out birding. It's a magnolia warbler. These guys are the only ones that have white going all the way through uh, their tail like this. So when you see them, it looks like their tail is dipped in black paint. Of course, if you see them like this, that's the last thing that will occur to you because they're pretty stunning. The necklace of yellow streaks on them and blue cap are, are pretty, pretty incredible. Another really distinctive one, American Red Star. It's got a high and thin song. Um, these guys look like Halloween. Um, uh, some people think they look like butterflies as well. Um, ma adult males look uh, really stunning in black and orange, um, sort of a glossy black color and orange. And females and young males actually look like this. So young males will have black splotches on this. It takes them two years to reach that full um, adult pattern. Um, this is a species that maintains territories on the wintering grounds, like a lot of these. Um, but you can actually imagine that this uh, female here blends into a uh, different type of habitat than this guy does. Um, so um, adult male red starts actually overwinter in sort of shady forest and all of that. Um, whereas females will tend to, and young males will tend to stick to more scrubby habitats. Uh, and then we've got our friend, another mid-season migrant, the oven bird. Extremely loud, and they, they shout, teacher, 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 teacher. Um, let's see here. And these guys are very unwarbler-like. Of the warblers you're likely to see, they're the largest, um, and they actually look a lot more like a thrush than a warbler. They uh, are very pot-bellied, have big eyes and a bold eye ring, um, and then the spots on a white belly underneath with sort of clay on the back, it really does make them look like uh, other species like wood thrushes and, and hermit thrushes. Um, and that's because these guys do, do and live in the same places uh, that uh, uh, do the same things and live in the same places that a lot of thrushes do. Um, so they probably evolved to have this coloration um, for, for uh, that very reason. Um, they're very well camouflaged from above. And if for some instance, if this guy's sitting way high up on a tree branch and singing, um, if you're brightly colored underneath and something's looking from below, uh, you might blend in with the sky as well. 
So oven birds are pretty fun. So those are some species to go through. I certainly didn't touch on all of them. Um, there are a whole bunch of late migrants that are very interesting. Um, these species all almost exclusively overwinter in South America. So we have the Canada warbler here on the left, upper left, um, the black pole warbler down below, um, the bay-breasted warbler like this. We saw one of these at the beginning. Um, and then in the upper right-hand corner, we've got a morning warbler. Um, and these are all species um, that people will start seeing and hearing in pretty good numbers or pretty decent numbers um, in the next week or so. Um, and as I said, these are, are late migrants. Um, so hopefully it gave you some ideas as to some things you can look for. Um, I certainly didn't cover it all, um, nor would I want to. That's, uh, that's a lot of information. Um, but if you're into completely uh, bombarding your senses with information uh, and you're obsessed with learning warblers, I would certainly suggest uh, the Warbler Guide. Uh, it is packed to the brim full of pages all about all the warblers you can find in North America, east and west. Um, and it's got crazy pages like this over here on the right, which is like all the faces of warblers. And then look, all of their undertail coverts as well, because, you know, we, we need to know that. But quite frankly, like I said, all of these things are helping you get familiar with the species so that when you see it, there's sort of that instant recognition factor that, that, that's, uh, that's helping you in the right direction. Um, there are plenty of great phone apps out there. Some are free, uh, some are, are, uh, are not. Um, I believe the Warbler Guide has a pay for app as well. that has got a whole bunch of different resources on it. Um, a great free app is actually Cornell's Merlin. Um, which can also help you identify birds if you want to try if you want to try their software on that. Um, but they also have a lot of free. Um, it's basically a, a free field guide for your smartphone. Um, so Merlin can be pretty good there. Um, but yeah, I, I would say uh, other birders are a great resource. It's much harder to get out into the field with other birders now. Um, I mean, in the place of this, I normally would be leading several walks, going out and looking for warblers and pointing them out with people. Um, so uh, that being said, uh, if you know a birder and uh, you have some questions about birds, send them along to them because they're probably really sad that they can't be talking to more people about birds. Um, so they'd sh I bet they'd love to get questions from you. Um, and really, I would say take advantage of this opportunity uh, to get out in the field and to just look for stuff. Um, and really just try to, like I said earlier, try to familiarize yourself with what's out there. Um, if you familiarize yourself with the common things, chances are if something uncommon comes through, you'll actually realize it. Um, and then you can, then you can ponder your way through that. Um, so I hope this was a good intro to Warblers. It's Warbler 101. Um, and uh, I hope you all are able to get out and uh, see some Warblers. And we'd love to hear about uh, some of the things that you see in the, in the coming weeks. Um, but I think now we're going to open it up uh, for questions. And... I am not privy to how this is going to uh, work, but we will try. Hi, Evan. Yeah, it's Chris. We've got a, a several questions that came in. Uh, Karen and Beth both had questions related to why warblers are called that. Um, is it the feet, their bills, food, something like that? Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, so warblers got their name, uh, as did so many other uh, North American species. Uh, from the old world versions of them. So like I said, there are warblers that exist over in the old world. Um, let me tell you, I've seen them. They, uh, honestly, they don't really look anything like our warblers, only that they're small and have pointy bills. Um, the uh, European warblers are, are often studies in brown uh, and white. Uh, and people go crazy over there if a warbler has wing bars on it. Um, most of ours are super crazy and really gaudy. Um, but uh, the warblers over in the old world got their name from their songs. Um, so they have warbling songs. Um, and uh, when a lot of people moved here from the old world, uh, they like to name all of their bird, all the birds here after everything back home. So uh, warblers were another victim of that. Great. And Eliza asks, uh, have magnolia warblers been found to have different wintering location preferences based on sex? 
That's a great question. Um, I would guess they might. Um, uh, female magnolia warblers don't look super different from males. Um, and I know that magnolia warblers are, are one of the more common species that you see in wintering flocks uh, down in Central America. I'm not sure if you see flocks with males and females. Um, my guess is you probably would. Uh, something like a um, red star, like I was saying earlier, um, males and females are going to be in different, uh, different habitats, but chances are um, males and females are hanging out in flocks together uh, in, in the wintering grounds. And in some species that can be particularly bad. Uh, for instance, with like um, Bicknell's thrushes, which is a species up in, um, that's only found on a few mountaintops in the Northeast and overwinters uh, on only a few islands in the Caribbean. Uh, males and females overwinter in the same places, but when they have less and less um, habitat for overwintering, the most dominant birds get the habitat. And in the case of Bicknell's thrushes, that's males. So on the breeding grounds, what they're seeing is, is that there are way more males on the breeding grounds than females. And females are far more important for the health of a population, uh, all politics aside. Um, so uh, that's a, that's a really, um, that's a really uh, important effect of, of habitat loss um, in the wintering grounds in some species. And we have a question from Renata who asked, uh, do warblers migrate over land only or also over the ocean? Great question. Um, so there really only are a few types of birds that migrate specifically over land. And those are birds that really rely upon soaring and not powered flight. Um, so those are things like raptors. Um, uh, we see huge kettles of uh, turkey vultures and broad wing hawks and Swainson's hawks that uh, when they move down to Central and South America from North America, they have to go over land. So they go over a very, uh, amazing route that goes right through Mexico. And there are some days down in Veracruz, Mexico, where they can see millions of, of raptors soaring overhead. But raptors rely upon columns of hot air during the day and they migrate there. Um, warblers, incredibly, like a lot of other species, including hummingbirds, rely upon powered flight. Um, so they tend to take the most direct route. Um, so a lot of these birds, like magnolia warblers, are actually flying north from the Yucatan and crossing several hundred miles over uh, nonstop over the Gulf of Mexico at night. Um, now you can imagine that uh, that can be pretty taxing on birds and if they don't have uh, the right energy stores, some of them can, uh, can uh, crash down in, or certainly crash down into the ocean and, and don't make it. Um, and a lot of them will arrive right on the Gulf Coast, um, completely exhausted and hopping around on the ground. Um, so it's, it's um, an amazing feat that they're capable of doing. But in general, warblers aren't reliant upon flying over land. That's a really good question, though. Another question we have asks, uh, on a time scale, uh, are warblers a fairly recent group? Uh, yeah, generally speaking, uh, I believe they are. Uh, usually when you see um, groups that are only found in the New World, groups of animals that are only found in the New World, they tend to be um, uh, pretty young in an evolutionary sense. Um, warblers are interesting, um, the, and warblers and um, sparrows and a few other species have actually lost one of their flight feathers. So instead of 10 of their primaries, which are kind of like their fingers, uh, they actually have nine on each wing. Um, and that's probably some indication of how sort of recently they've evolved. Um, I'm not 100% familiar with the most recent uh, uh, taxonomic um, changes that have been made. Um, people seem to, to constantly be switching around where birds are. Um, and actually these taxonomic changes are the reason why, for some instance, in some instances, if you look at an older field guide, um, they try to put things taxonomically. So they put loons in the front. Uh, but in a more recent field guide, ducks might be in the front. Um, the same thing holds true for warblers. Um, generally speaking, what they put at the end is, is thought to be, at the time, uh, the most recent group. Great. And uh, Liliana asks, um, she, she notes that uh, she saw lots of black and white warblers uh, this morning and asked where uh, or what height do they typically nest at? And is there a preference for a species of tree? Uh, great question. Um, so black and white warblers are interesting. Uh, so 
Uh, like I said, um, warblers have a, a, a real diverse array of uh, characteristics. Um, so some of them will feed in different, or a lot of them feed in different areas or in different ways. They also nest in different areas in different ways. Um, so things like uh, this magnolia warbler here typically nests in a spruce tree, um, anywhere from a few feet off the ground to maybe 10, 15 feet off the ground. Um, a black and white warbler, they're interesting in that they actually nest on the ground or very close to the ground in a tree stump. Um, other species will nest in tree cavities. There are two species of warbler that nest in, in tree cavities. Uh, those are the prothonotary warbler in the east and the Lucy's warblers in the west. Um, and then things like a pine warbler might build their nest 100 feet up in a pine tree. Um, but yeah, as far as black and white warblers go, uh, they tend to be very close to the ground if not on it. And uh, Russell asks, uh, which is the most common warbler banded at Manomet, and has that changed over the years? That is a really great question, um, and one that I don't really know off the top of my head. Um, Magnolia warbler is one of our more common ones that comes through. Um, historically, we had very large years of catching myrtle warblers, um, or the yellow rumped warbler. Um, yellow rump warblers, like I said, their migration is heavily tied to the coast because of their uh, tendency to eat bayberries. But interestingly, over the last few years, we've seen a really stark drop off in the number of uh, yellow rump warblers or myrtle warblers that we're catching. Um, we're not exactly sure why. Um, and that's actually a species where not only can we be looking at banding data that we're collecting, um, but since they overwinter in the United States, we can actually historically look at something called the Christmas bird count and look at numbers there. And that's something we've started looking into and, and asking other banding stations if they've seen the same patterns. Um, and they seem to have, where there are fewer, uh, fewer yellow rump warblers. Um, but we had, we've had years in the past where we catch hundreds. Um, so it, it's uh, pretty variable. Great. And uh, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, Thomas notes, it's his understanding that the timing of vegetation emergence is influenced by degree days, while migration is driven more by day length. Uh, this suggests that climate change can really influence what foods are available when the migrants arrive. And he asked that you comment on that. Yeah, uh, that's an, it's an excellent point. Um, and uh, certainly something that uh, is, is uh, cause or potentially cause for something we call uh, ecological mismatch. So if we think of, of um, so I, I, I hinted to this, but didn't really hit on it very well. So I, I, I'm glad you're bringing this up now. Um, but yeah, as, as these birds are migrating north, um, ecologically there, or, or historically, um, the point or the, the, the point of their timing um, is for them to arrive um, along the East Coast and certain spots along the East Coast um, and have their arrival coincide with the peak emergence of caterpillars um, that are coming out and eating uh, the new fresh leaves on trees. Now you can imagine there are a lot of players in this. There are the trees themselves um, and whether or not a tree is leafing out is, is heavily influenced by uh, temperature. So as you were saying, the degree days or, or um, essentially sort of uh, the number of warmth, uh, warm days out there. Um, and if a tree is slow to leaf out like they are this year in the Northeast, um, the caterpillars aren't going to hatch either. Um, their hatching is heavily coincided with leaf out, which is also temperature driven. Um, uh, if leaves get too big, uh, the caterpillars can't eat them. So there's a lot of pressure on caterpillars to hatch out at the right time too. But there's also a ton of pressure on a magnolia warbler here to arrive right at that peak so it can stuff its face full of caterpillars and leave either that night or the next night. Um, so they're putting on a ton of subcutaneous fat and then flying four or 500 miles potentially in one night. Um, so you can imagine if it's a, a, warm, or a, a warm year and the emergence happens sooner and the caterpillars are past their prime when this guy gets here, um, the results could actually be um, catastrophic, uh, particularly for female birds. Um, it's been shown that if females don't get a lot of um, provisioning, um, that they're, they're not really capable of uh, producing broods once they get, uh, or full-sized broods when they get back up to the uh, nesting areas. Um, and so this is one of the huge uh, drivers of why, we're, why we continue to ban birds. Um, we've noticed changes in timing of certain species. 
uh, particularly short distance migrants that are aware of how far along leaf, leaf out is. Um, but for species like those long distance migrants, like um, for instance, uh, 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 I would say the bay breasted warbler, for instance, um, you know, if they're not coming back uh, in time for some of these uh, emergences of, of food, um, that mismatch can be really detrimental to their success. It's kind of a long answer, but uh, it's a really uh, interesting topic, and it's one that, that doesn't just apply to, to land birds, it also applies to our work with shorebirds too. So some of the research we're doing in, in the Arctic um, uh, is, is looking at ecological mismatch up there. Fantastic. Well, Evan, I want to thank you so much for sharing your insight, your knowledge with us today. Uh, really do appreciate it and, and just want to thank everyone else for being part of tonight's presentation. Uh, I know many of you are longtime members and supporters of Manonet, so thank you so much. Just want you to know how grateful we are for your generosity and commitment. And I uh, just want to thank you all for visiting us today. I hope to see you again on a future webinar. Uh, you can visit our website at manomet.org. We have an events page there with all of our uh, upcoming webinars. We've got a few in the works. And, uh, and again, just look for that follow-up email tomorrow. We'll be sharing a link to the recording for tonight's presentation. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Again, you can visit us online at manomet.org. So thank you again, everyone. And thank you, Evan. Get out there birding, and uh, I'm looking forward to putting my sweatpants on. I'm kidding. I'm wearing them already. <laughs> Thanks, Evan. <laughs>